This is the ninth in a series of lectures on algebra for students of MS 2014 and MS 3014 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we'll look at field extensions. Consider what happens when we quotient out a polynomial rather than quotienting an integer. So we take some p of x, working over a field uh, k, and um, we consider that two remainders, b of x or c of x, are equal a mod a p of x if they have the same remainder when we quotient out all the p of x's. So we can think of those as remainders mod p of x and we'll add, multiply, and subtract in the obvious way by actually adding, multiplying, and subtracting polynomials and then taking remainders. Um, we could also ask how would we go about finding reciprocals What's the reciprocal of such a thing? Obviously, the reciprocal of a polynomial, of a non-constant polynomial, can't be a polynomial in the usual sense of reciprocal, it, not as a function or not as a, not as a polynomial. But, uh, but as a remainder, it can. Uh, what it means to be an, an inverse or reciprocal for, uh, for a remainder is that we want uh, that b of x times b of x inverse should be 1 up to p of x's. In other words, when we write b of x inverse, we mean some remainder so that this product of polynomials is 1 plus a multiple of p of x. And how do we find such a thing? If we were trying to explicitly calculate out um, one of these reciprocals of remainders, we do it by a process of putting b of x and p of x in as polynomials, not as remainders. Obviously not as remainders, so otherwise the p of x would disappear. And then we carry out the, the bazoo coefficient calculations. Let's think about a simple example of this pr process. Um, uh, let's consider uh, p of x to be x cubed plus 2x plus 1 over the rational numbers, the field of rational numbers. So our coefficients are drawn from rational numbers. Um, then if we mod out by the p of x's, of course, uh, x cubed plus 2x plus 1 will be 0 which is uh, then telling us that x cubed will be minus 2x plus 1 up to p of x's. So in remainders, these will be the same remainder. That means, therefore, that you can knock off any cube of, of x or any higher power of x and write it more simply in terms of some lower powers by repeatedly using this rule. So third powers go down to being these, these first powers and so on. It's traditional uh, to write um, write alpha or something like some Greek letter to mean um, could be beta gamma um, to mean the remainder of the polynomial x when we mod out by the p of x's so we just write it as alpha and so instead of writing something like x cubed equals minus 2x plus 1 mod p of x's we'll simply write that as alpha cubed equals minus 2 alpha plus 1 and we won't write mod p of x because it'll be understood that those are remainders. It's understood we'll use this Greek letter notation that we're passing to remainders. This enables us to reduce, again, any, any power, uh, three or higher, repeatedly by, um, by threes at a time down to, to a lower power with only one alpha in it. And so we can write any polynomial in alpha by using polynomials of most degree two because three and higher we, write, we rewrite using this rule. As an example, we can compute out what happens when we multiply um, alpha squared plus 1 times alpha squared plus alpha plus 1. And again, remember that we're saying that alpha cubed is minus 2 alpha minus 1 in our uh, quotient, in our space of remainders. Um, so if we expand this out just using usual algebra, we get alpha to the fourth plus alpha cubed plus alpha squared plus alpha squared plus alpha plus 1. And um, we can then put the, uh, gather the terms together, the alpha squareds. Now alpha to the fourth we can write as alpha times alpha cubed. And then this alpha cubed factor, these will just stay as they were because we're only quotienting alpha cubes down to be these simpler expressions. So every time we have a third or higher power, we can factor out 3 at a time of the power and um, replace it by minus 2 alpha minus 1. Alpha cubed becomes minus 2 alpha minus 1 
plus 2 alpha squared plus alpha plus 1 and then just simply expand that out so get minus 2 alpha squared minus alpha minus 2 alpha minus 1 uh, plus 2 alpha squared plus alpha plus 1 and if you cancel out all the terms you just get minus 2 alpha so you can see how to do computations in this quotient so this is what we do when we quotient out um, p of x is x squared uh, plus 2x plus 1 oh sorry x cubed plus 2x plus 1 was what we quotiented out by and we write the remainder as alpha and then we've just manipulated it using this rule an even simpler example we could look at um, just letting p of x be x squared um, over uh, some field I don't even need to say what field um, so the coefficients are over some field but doesn't matter which one and then we let again alpha uh, be the remainder of x when we mod out by all the p of x's right not as x but as alpha and then the possible remainders then have to be the form b plus c alpha where b and c are in the field that we uh, the field of our coefficients that we're working over um, so the, everything looks like this with one alpha and then this has no alphas because if you had higher alphas then you'd always use this to reduce them because alpha squared is zero in other words we're modding up by by uh, the x squared polynomial and alpha is the remainder of x so alpha squared is the remainder of x squared which is zero so um, so that gives us these kinds of numbers and we can say that these are something like is uh, like the um, the very small quantities that um, that physicists uh, talk about when um, when they do their calculations they have quantities that are supposed to be so small that the squares can be ne neglected from computations and of course ordinary numbers don't have that property you can't uh, with a real number get its square to be zero unless it's already zero but with these kind of strange numbers we've created here we've created a, a ring in which there are the quantities where um, where the squares actually become zero so you can think of them as like very small uh, quantities a similar example if we um, if we let p of x instead of being x squared be x times x minus 1 and it could be over any field then uh, we could s ask what does this do uh, we get a quantity alpha which again is the remainder of x mod p of x and what happens with this alpha what does it look like well it, it, it alpha is not zero and uh, because x is non zero mod p of x p of x is bigger degree than x so we're not modding up by anything of degree one also alpha minus one is not zero alpha is not one but alpha times alpha minus one is zero because uh, we've modded out by these it's the remainder when we mod out the x times x minus ones remainder of x so this quantity becomes uh, the remainder of x x minus one mod x x minus one so it's zero and so even though the quant the number's not zero and not one it wants to satisfy this equation which is satisfied by zero and one and so it wants to be sort of zero and sort of be one but it doesn't know which one it wants to be it sort of wants to be sort of z alpha something like zero but it's also something like one at the same time a sort of mysterious object that wants to be one one of wants to be at either location but doesn't know which one it's going to choose now we've already said that we were going to think about um about how to calculate out bazoo coefficients uh, or using bazoo coefficient how to calculate out reciprocals so let's try an example this guy's going to be x cubed plus x plus one over a field and the field will just be the field of remainders mod two that'll make our calculations much much simpler than if we worked with more complicated fields and again alpha is going to be the remainder of x when we mod out all the p of x's so um so we'll call that alpha now let's try and find a reciprocal of alpha squared plus alpha plus one how do we find its reciprocal we don't know that there is one um, and there might not be one in general maybe this doesn't have a reciprocal um, but the, the the general technique is is very straightforward we're going to just try to look at bazoo coefficients um, so we're going to put the the polynomial we want to invert now it's in x's not in alphas when we try to do the bazoo coefficients because it's supposed to be thought of as an actual polynomial not just as a remainder and then we'll take the p of x that we want to mod out by x cubed plus x plus one 
now we have to try and uh, carry out the bazoo coefficient calculation. But you can see that if I want to get rid of the x cubed as the highest power, it's the one you want to get rid of. So to get rid of it, I'll add a multiple, suitable multiple of, of this to this. And of course, what multiple is it? It's just the multiple x. x times this row to this row. That will make that an x cubed, and two x cubed are 0. Remember, we're working in the coefficients, which are remainders mod 2, and so 2 is 0. So if I multiply this by x, I get x cubed. Add that to that, I get 2 x cubed, and 2 is 0. So that'll knock out the x cubed. And so we'll get 1, 0, x, 1, uh, x squared plus 1. And this guy stays the same, x squared plus x plus 1. Because you can see this uh, x cubed to this one, x squared goes in here, and then x uh, plus x is 0, leaving the 1. So that gives us a simpler expression. But now we have to get rid of one of the two. doesn't matter which one. Let's uh, try uh, adding uh, one to, of this to this, one of the second row to the first row. So the x squared will knock out the x squared, giving us x plus 1, 1, x and x1, x squared plus 1. Now we kind of want to use, so again, that's, uh, we did one of these to this, so the x squared hits the x squared, the 1 is the 1, leaving the x. And now we want to get rid of, as much as possible, of this guy. It's got degree 2, so we're going to use the x to get rid of the x squared. So to do x times this to this, giving us um, uh, the first row stays the same, and the second row becomes um, uh, x times this to this gives me uh, x squared plus x, so it's x squared, and then x plus 1 here, and then 1, because the x uh, times x hits the x squared, and so we're done. And that gives us the, the result we want. These are the bazoo coefficients. You can see the GCD is going to be 1. If you kept going, you'd kill this x, turn to 0. We don't need to do that. You can already see that those are going to be the bazoo coefficients, and the GCD is 1. And so we get bazoo coefficients x squared and x plus 1 from here, and that's going to equal 1. The first bazoo coefficient goes against this guy, x squared plus x plus 1. And then the x plus 1 goes against the second guy, x cubed plus x plus 1 equals 1. Now all this is just polynomial from here to here. All of this is just going on in po the world of polynomials, not the world of remainders. We've been working with polynomials in x, and now we're going to pass to remainders. Um, get rid of the quotient out, the, the, the p of x here, this guy here. Um, so uh, when we quotient out, every all the x's turn to alpha, so we get alpha squared, alpha squared plus alpha plus 1. And then um, uh, this disappears because that's the p of x itself that becomes 0 when we put the alphas in. And so we get equals 1. And so we've actually found the reciprocal of this to be this. We found that alpha squared is 1 over alpha squared plus alpha plus 1 in this uh, world of these remainders. We're much more often interested in fields than we are in other rings. They're the ones we like the most, the easiest ones to work in, in particular in building bigger fields. Um, once we have a field, we want to make bigger fields and bigger fields to see if we can use them to solve various equations, various polynomials. And so if I have um, a field sitting inside another field um, it's a sub as a sub ring on both are fields um, then we call it a sub field for the obvious reason um, and but when we also say as I say k is a sub field of big k or big k is a field extension of little k. How could we write down examples of field extensions? Um, what what could we use? Um, we could use a basis, a basis of big K over little k is a, a, a collection of elements, a finite collection of elements, um, alpha 1, alpha 2, dot, 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 dot alpha n, of big K so that every element of big K is uniquely expressed as um, some amount of 
alpha 1 plus some amount of alpha 2 plus dot, 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 dot plus some amount of alpha n of these basis elements where the coefficients, the a's, are in the little k. And the degree is the um, smallest number of elements in any basis. You, you can fairly easily show that that number is the same actually for any two bases. So, um, for example, our, one of our favorites is uh, that the real numbers then sit inside the complex numbers. But we know that we can write every, every complex number as x times 1 plus y times i. And so therefore, 1 and i, well, they have to form a basis. Um, but you can express it better uniquely this way. And so they form a basis. A another simple example, um, let's write q of root 2 to mean um, uh, the uh, field, ge uh, field generated by adding root 2 to q. And that means, therefore, precisely that means all the rational um, expressions, all the rational functions, um, uh, some polynomial, what, what with a root 2 plugged in, over some other polynomial, the root 2 plugged in, uh, where the p and the q are uh, rational coefficient polynomials. Um, so that's what q of root 2 means. And then, of course, 1 and root 2 form a basis, which you can prove. It's not obviously form a basis because we're allowing all such expressions, but it turns out that every one of them can be simplified to look like a plus b root 2. It's not obvious that all such things can be simplified to this form, but it's something you can show not without too much effort. I'll leave you to think about why that's true. Another natural um, example to think about is um, to think about the rational numbers, which sit inside the real numbers, um, but not equal to. And in fact, very, very far away from. In some sense, they're very, very small by comparison. Um, uh, this ext field extension has no basis. It's an infinite uh, degree extension. So an extension is infinite degree if it has no basis. The fact that it's infinite degree is actually difficult to prove. And obviously, we won't be proving it in, in these lectures. Another example is if we have um, uh, one field contained in another field, and then that contained in yet another field, um, these are finite and they're all finite degree extensions, then um, it's clear that k contained in L is also finite degree. Why is that? Because um, if you take a bunch of alphas as a basis for, um, for k over little k, big k over little k, and a bunch of betas as a basis for um, L over capital K, then you can check, I'll leave you to, to, to convince yourself that the set of products alphas times betas is a basis for L over little k. So in particular, what we find is that degrees actually multiply. Um, so if we have uh, degree, so de the degree of L as an extension of little k is the product of its degree as an extension over big K times the de degree of big K over little k. Just as we got the complex numbers um, by trying to add a number to the reals that would satisfy x squared plus 1 is 0, we tried to add a root to that. There's no root in the real numbers. Well, we, if we add a root, we get the complex numbers. So we want to think more generally about adding a root um, to, uh, to an arbitrary polynomial that just doesn't have one. Let's do an example of this process. Um, so let's let p of x be x squared plus x plus 1 over the field little k is z mod 2z, our favorite field because it's so much easier to work with than the other ones. Um, and you can check that that's actually the lowest degree polynomial that doesn't have a root. The simplest thing you can come up with has no root. Let's just check that it has no root. If we try x is 0 or 1, p of x is then when x is 0, 0 squared plus 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 squared plus 1 plus 1 is 1 in um, Again, this is in this z mod 2z. 
now let's let um, let capital K, our extension that we're trying to build here, be that ring. I won't say it's a field. We'll check that it's a field. But the ring of all remainders of um, uh, polynomials modulo, we mod it by P of x, so mod polynomials in some variable x. And as usual, let alpha be the remainder of x when we mod out by those p of x's. So we have the obvious equation that uh, that um, p of x is x squared plus x plus 1. That's just this definition. And so when we mod out by the p of x's, we get 0 equals alpha squared plus alpha plus 1, which we can rewrite. As we've seen before, the trick is to rewrite that as solving for the highest power of alpha that appears, alpha squared is minus alpha minus 1, but we're working with coefficients in, in um, Z2 coefficients. Here we are again, Z2, and in Z2 minus 1 is plus 1, so uh, alpha squared is alpha plus 1, making it a bit easier to work with. So the obvious consequence is that any, uh, any polynomial in alpha reduces by uh, taking all this alpha squares and turning them to alpha plus ones, you reduce the power, anything that has a power two or more, down to one, bound by one power, repeatedly going on, and it reduces to some linear expression. But linear, what could linear be? Well, linear with coefficients that come from our field, and again, our field is, uh, is just going to have zeros and ones in it, because that's all that we have in our field. It's z mod 2z. So we've got linear functions in alpha, where the coefficients are either zeros or ones. And that means, therefore, the only possibilities are well, we could use all zero coefficients, use a one, use an alpha, or an alpha plus one. And that way, we've got, got all the possible polynomials of degree up to one, um, degree zero, one in, in alpha, and with zero, one coefficients. So now we can actually uh, use this to compute out explicitly what is the, the addition table, what does it look like? Uh, for this k. Again, that was 0, 1, alpha, and alpha plus 1. And so we can calculate out its addition law. 0, 1, alpha, and alpha plus 1. 0, 1, alpha, and alpha plus 1. So we can make a, a an addition table What's uh, well, zero plus zero is is always zero. Zero plus anything is that thing, so that makes the first line easy. Similarly, anything plus zero has got to be that thing, so that's easy. And then if you add anything to itself, you get two of them, but two is zero, so these have to be zeros. And so that's the easy bit. Um, then we can say what happens if we add one? One, uh, one plus alpha is alpha plus one. Uh, one plus alpha plus one. One plus one is zero, so you get alpha. And then alpha plus 1 is alpha plus 1. Alpha plus alpha plus 1 is uh, 2 alphas are 0 alphas, so you just get 1. Um, alpha plus 1 plus 1. 1 plus 1 is 0, so you get alpha. Alpha plus alpha plus 1. 2 alphas are 0, so you get 1. And there's the entire table. So we calculated it out just by obvious observations about the fact that basically uh, 2 equals 0. So that's all we need to know about that. That's how we can get the whole addition law worked out. What about the multiplication law? We can try and do the same thing. Do a multiplication law. Uh, So, uh, so again, we have 0, 1, alpha, and alpha plus 1. And let's try and multiply them out. But there's very little we, we need to do um, when we multiply out. Um, uh, so, um, so we have very simple laws that uh, we only had one law, which was that alpha squared was alpha plus 1. So anytime you have two alphas multiplied by each other, you're replaced by alpha plus 1. Um, so now 0 times anything is always 0. We're doing a multiplication table rather than addition now. So 0 times anything is 0. 0 times anything is 0. That gives us a lot of the entries. 1 times anything is that thing. 1 times anything is that thing. And then we're only left with these entries that we have to work out. Alpha times alpha is alpha squared, which is alpha plus 1. 
and then we well, I'll leave you to work out if you do alpha times alpha plus 1, you get alpha squared plus alpha. Reduce modulo this law, and I'll let you check you get a 1 here. Similarly, alpha times alpha plus 1, um, you get alpha squared plus alpha. Reduce modulo this law, and you can check you get 1. And then finally, we have alpha plus 1, alpha plus 1. We expand it all out and simplify all the terms, and I'll let you check you get alpha. So, um, so that's the entire multiplication table worked out for us. So that takes care of, of addition and multiplication. What about division? Let's see if we can find reciprocals. Well, if you just look at the table, the multiplication table, you can look for reciprocals. Well, 1 times 1 is 1, which means that in particular 1 reciprocal is 1. Um, but alpha times, here we have alpha times alpha plus 1 is 1. And so if I take alpha and multiply by alpha plus 1, I'll get 1. So alpha inverse is alpha plus 1. Um, Similarly, alpha plus 1 times alpha is 1, and so alpha plus 1 inverse is alpha. Alpha, is alpha plus 1 times alpha is 1. Okay, so that gives you all the reciprocals, because there are only four elements, and 0 can't have a reciprocal in any, in any field. So there you go, that's all the reciprocals. So now we know how to do the adding, subtracting, and multiplying. Um, well, sorry, the, the adding, the multiplying, and the dividing. Um, and the subtracting is fairly easy because, after all, plus is minus. And so we do know the subtracting from that fact that the addition and the subtraction have the same, exactly the same table. Another obvious observation about this is that everybody has a reciprocal except 0. Looking down the list here, 0, 1, alpha, alpha plus 1, all these three, they all have reciprocals. Only 0 doesn't. And so therefore, k is a field. We said we'd prove that, and now we've proven it. So the, this k is a field. It's not obvious that it had to be a field. We don't see a reason why it would have to be, but we can see it from the calculation that it has to be, that it turns out to be a field. So in other words, we started with little k, which was z mod 2z, and now we found it sitting in, not being equal to, some capital K, which is a field extension, 0, 1, alpha, alpha plus 1. And if we think about what we're doing with this larger field, we can say, well, p of x, our original polynomial, was um, uh, was x squared plus x plus 1. But if you check, it actually splits into x plus alpha times x plus alpha plus 1. And now you see uh, why we write alpha, a Greek letter, for uh, remainder of x mod p of x. Why don't we use x? Why don't we just write it as x mod p of x? We write it as alpha so that we can now get back to allowing x to be used as an abstract variable again in this expression right here. We've, uh, we now want to distinguish x and alpha. Alpha is this remainder when we mod out the p of x's from uh, uh, the remainder of x when we mod out the p of x's. But we want to think of it as a separate kind of object from an abstract variable x, so that we can work with expressions like this, in which there's both an abstract variable x and this remainder object sitting in the same expression and treated as very different, uh, very different things. But another observation is that now p, which was actually an irreducible polynomial, had no roots over k and was actually therefore irreducible. It splits over big K. Over big K, it's now broken up into two linear factors. So we wonder, why did that work? Why was it that we were able to split it up into linear factors? So we have a theorem, which is, again, that p of x is a polynomial in one variable over a field, little k. And um, then we'll let alpha, again, be the remainder of x. We mod out the p of x's. And then we'll let k of alpha, instead of calling it capital K, we'll call it this guy, be the, the set of um, the ring of all remainders mod p of x. When we mod out the p of x is from the polynomials. And that those, of course, can all be written as polynomials uh, expressions in expressions in alpha. Right, because uh, every single one of them started with a polynomial in x, but we modded out by the p of x's, and modding out by that means turns x into alphas. So that's how we can think of it as being something like polynomials in alpha, although alpha is not an abstract variable. So it's a bit of danger um, in this notation. Alpha 
is not an abstract variable here. So that notation is a bit dangerous because we said previously when we wrote k with these brackets here and something in there that was supposed to be an abstract variable. But now alpha is not an abstract variable, it's a remainder. And so this notation is a bit suggestive that its polynomial expression is an alpha. But alpha shouldn't be thought of as an abstract variable, but as this remainder so that it does satisfy the requirement that p of alpha is 0. So then what, we've just, what we can say is that um, then p of x has a root root specifically the root alpha in this larger ring k of alpha and what we're going to claim is that in fact um, k of alpha is a field if and only if um, p of x is irreducible over the little field little k and if that happens if so, then k of alpha, the collection of all the polynomial expressions in alpha, is also k of alpha, the rational functions where you plug in alphas and throw away the ones where that gives you a zero denominator. Um, so I'll let that be the obvious notation for rational expressions in this alpha. Any gain you have to throw out, any rational expression doesn't make any sense because the denominator goes to zero. And, uh, and uh, also, um, k contained in this k of alpha is actually a field extension. This thing's a field. We found that in our example, but we couldn't see why, why it had to be a field. We just calculated out the addition and multiplication law, and we found the multiplication law was suitable, so that it, it did turn out to be a field. But we find in here that the theorem says that in general it has to be a field. And in that field um, uh, in which uh, p of x splits off a linear factor, Why? Because it has a root. We already said it has a root, so that's pretty clear. So let's see the proof of this result that this is basically is telling us that our previous our previous example that really had to be a field for some reason. And um, let's say um, what we what we want to do is to look for reciprocals. So if we take some polynomial in alpha in um, in this k of alpha, we want to ask and suppose it's not zero. We can ask: Is it have a, does it have a reciprocal? Um, well, no, we know it has a reciprocal somewhere, but does it have a reciprocal? Well, in in uh, in this k of alpha, um, that's the question: Is it possible to produce a reciprocal? Well, if um, p of x is irreducible, then what you do is you look at the you do the Bezu coefficient calculation just like we did on one zero zero. No, oh, sorry, zero one. Not on remainders, but again on polynomials, b of x, p of x. And we can assume that b of x has smaller degree, because if it doesn't have smaller degree, we know we can reduce. Any expression in alpha can be reduced, we've seen, down, 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 to have smaller degree than the minimal polynomial of alpha, than, than, the, than, the, sorry, than p of x. So, um, so it has smaller degree uh, than uh, this p of x. This one is smaller degree than this one, because if it has bigger degree, you just uh, get rid of it, simplify it uh, in, in this expression here, where you've got this alpha plugged into it, make it use a smaller polynomial that expresses the same thing by using a rule to rewrite the highest power of alpha in p of x uh, as, as something lower. So when you're done the bazoo coefficient calculation, you get s of x, b of x plus t of x, p of x equal to the GCD. But if this guy's irreducible, it can't be divisible. P is irreducible. It can't be divisible by this smaller degree b. Um, that then it wouldn't be irreducible in, anymore. Um, so it has no GCD. The GCD has to be one. It can't be sorry. It can't be divisible by any by by this by this smaller degree guy. This GCD can't divide into p of x unless it's unless it's uh, it's a constant because nothing of smaller degree can divide in. And so this guy has to be a constant. And so can after rescaling can be made one. And so this uh, then enables us to divide to mod out by the um, p of x's and get s of alpha b of alpha equals one. So if p of x is irreducible, the bazoo coefficient calculation will give us these bazoo coefficients here. Uh, the GCT will have to be one because it's irreducible, uh, and then you can um, because it can't have a common factor with the b of x, which is smaller degree, and then you can reduce and get this. What if p of x is reducible? is reducible. We want to show that somehow this doesn't work. 
So P of X is a product B of X times C of X. And that means that zero is P of alpha is some B of alpha C of alpha. Oops, um, so if um, so if B of X had a reciprocal some one over suppose it has some one over B of alpha a reciprocal in um, in K of alpha then you could multiply both sides by it and you get zero equals um, you get zero equals divide you're dividing off a of B of alpha and you get zero equals C of alpha um, so if this is reducible, that means, means this is zero c of alpha. That's in remainders uh, mod uh, mod p of x. So we go out, out back into polynomials. We get zero equals c of x mod p of x. Because alpha is just x mod p of x, and so we plug in got that here. In other words, c of x is a multiple. There's no remainder when you divide the p of x, so it's a multiple of p of x, and um, and that's a contradiction because we can assume it had degree smaller. It's a remainder. We're working with remainders mod uh, mod um, p of x. Uh, so it does. So there can't we can't have that happen. And now that everybody has a reciprocal, if we look at the uh, the, the rational functions, they're going to have numerators and denominators. But the denominators are going to have reciprocals, um, and so you could just write them as products um, of inside. Um, inside k of alpha because you can replace the denominator by by its reciprocal um, which is also in k of alpha and so you can replace any any ratio by a by by a, by a straightforward product of polynomials in alpha so um so this process is called adding a root we've added a root we've created this new alpha which is a root we started off with a field and we con constructed out of a new field a larger field in which this p of x polynomial has a has a factor now this worked with p of x irreducible. Um, if p of x is not irreducible, um, you could always split it into into irreducible factors and add roots to each until you get roots a complete set of roots for p of x. So you want to think about the general theory of of, of adding roots and how it fits into a more abstract notion of of algebraic extensions. So um, uh, so, take an extension so little case it's in big case big case an extension of little k um, an element u in big k is algebraic over little k if um, it is a root of some um, polynomial in one variable over little k, uh, which is not constant, not the zero polynomial. Now, if um, if that polynomial factors, u is a root of, of one of the factors. To be a root of a polynomial, if it factors the root of one of the factors. So we can keep going until we get an irreducible. Um, we can assume it's, it, it solves an irreducible polynomial. Um, but if uh, u satisfies two um, two such polynomial equations, it also satisfies a root of two polynomials. Then it also satisfies. It's also a root of their GCD. And so in this way, we can keep going down, down, down. We take all the polynomials it satisfies and take the GCD of all of them, and we get rise to a minimal polynomial. Um, so it satisfies a polynomial of minimal degree. And that polynomial has to be unique up to scaling. Why? Suppose there were two. Well, if there were two, then it would satisfy their GCD, which would be even smaller in degree. So you could keep going down and down and down until you finally hit this unique polynomial that satisfies a unique up to scaling. And we'll scale, um, as always, to get the leading uh, coefficient to be 1, to be, to be 1. That's called a monic polynomial. Monic polynomial is one with leading coefficient 1. And now it's unique. 
because it was unique up to scaling, but we chose a scaling, so now it's unique, and it's called the minimal polynomial of that element u of that field. So if there is such a polynomial, there's a minimal one, and it's uniquely determined if we make it monic. So we want to think about um, algebraic elements and their minimal polynomials. So a simple corollary of our previous result is that if we take a, a field extension, so little k containing a big K, and then um, and some element u in K, uh, then it's algebraic uh, over little k just when uh, the um, polynomials expressions in U, we plug that element in that field into all possible polynomials and write that as K of U, um, and just when that's equal to that, um, and that's contained in here, um, is a uh, finite degree field extension. So we're claiming not only that it's a finite degree field extension, but also these happen to be equal. Of well, of little k. If this happens, we might ask: Is there some different way? To, does, it, does it depend on the capital K? The when you add a root in some capital K and you add a root in some other capital K, do they look the same? And it does uh, happen that that was right. That, that does happen. They do look the same. Then um, K of U is in fact isomorphic to K of alpha, where um, alpha is. Uh, the remainder of x mod this p of x, where this p of x is the minimal polynomial, the min poly, the min polynomial of u. So this says that when we add a root, there's really only one way to do it, because if you did, you might say, well, I'll, I'll pick a big field in which I find a root, somebody else picks a field in which they find a root, but we have this canonical construction of adding a root. It doesn't involve uh, having to, to know of any bigger field, capital K. You don't have to know that there is one out there. You can build it yourself, just like we did in our previous example. We actually added a formal root alpha, almost inventing a, like inventing an algebraic symbol out of, out of the air, out of nothing. But we know what rules it has to satisfy, so we can write down its multiplication addition table. And that constructs this bigger field abstractly, but it turns out if you concretely actually found somewhere some actual field with some actual root in it, it would turn out to be just a copy of this guy. It looks exactly the same. So how do we prove this result? Um, well, uh, what we want to think about is whether or not this guy is finite dimensional. Uh, it's a finite dimensional vector space over uh, this field capital little k, and I'm assuming you've got enough linear algebra to be comfortable with that, the term finite dimensional vector space. Um, at this point, if you're not familiar with the vector spaces, that you might just skip this proof. Um, so, uh, so that happens exactly when one u u squared to the dot. Yeah, well, if that happens, then clearly these are in a finite dimensional vector space, and so the, they can't be all linearly dependent. And so there's a linear relation uh, after finitely many steps. into that sequence, you have to encounter a linear relation between its, between its entries. And conversely, if you did have some relation, then it would tell you that some power was expressed in terms of lower powers. But that means once we have such a relation, we can use it to get all the higher powers in terms of lower powers successively by the same trick used over and over again. And so this becomes finite dimensional. Um, and so if we write this, um, this relation, we'll write it as, say, a naught plus times 1 plus a1 times u plus a2 times a2 times u squared plus da 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 and it'll go up to some a n times u to the n equals zero, some linear relation. And let's just scale that to be equal to one. So um so this this gives a polynomial relation. Um and uh, so that means exactly that that happens exactly when u is algebraic. And we can always arrange this guy to be the minimal polynomial. Um, uh, so can um, we can choose this, uh, the minimal polynomial, 
because it's an algebraic relationship, it's a it's a polynomial in u, and we could and we could find the smallest polynomial in such a polynomial in u, which is just the minimal polynomial. So one uh, obvious uh, fact is if you just take this expression and you were to um, to try and solve uh, it by um, do, to work out what the inverse of u is, so use a non-zero element of some field capital K, it has some reciprocal. Let's um, let's try and solve for that. If you just write this expression uh, down and you multiply both sides by some, uh, well, you pull this guy over to the other side, let's say, uh, and then multiply by some u inverse, you get that u inverse equals, I'll leave you to check the algebra, minus 1 over a naught times a1 plus a2u plus dot, dot, dot plus uh, some u to the n minus 1. So that says we can find a reciprocal. It's a polynomial in u. So I've solved this um, for u inverse uh, from this expression here by multiplying both sides by u inverse and then and then solving for it. We get this. So this means, therefore, that u inverse is in uh, polynomial expressions in u. And on the other hand, if u inverse is in a polynomial in u, then you can go backwards and you can get this. So this is exactly the same as that. So these are all equivalent statements. But once this works for some u, it actually works for also um, for any element of uh, k of u, because uh, this is still finite dimensional, and by the same um, by the same argument, you're going to get that it also has an inverse, has an in, has reciprocal, it has reciprocal or inverse in the same uh, space. So we've argued to have a finite dimensional extension here. Then there's a reciprocal in here. This finite dimensional guy, which is which is um, this vector space over u. Then it, then everybody in it has a reciprocal in it. So that gives us that k of u is a field. So we found that if it's a finite dimensional vector space, it's actually a field, which is not obvious. Now what we want to do is to figure out how to relate this um, very concrete somehow extension. We've sat this guy inside some k of u, which is sitting inside some k. Um, what we want to do is to figure out how does that relate to the abstract k of alpha extension that we constructed before. So what we're going to do is to make a map which takes polynomials over k to polynomials in u by the obvious that 1 goes to 1, x goes to u, dot, 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 polynomial, and x goes to polynomial in u. So any polynomial in x goes to the same polynomial, but with u plugged in for x, just plug in x is u. And it's obvious that this takes addition to addition and multiplication to multiplication, subtraction to subtraction. So it matches up all the all the arithmetic of the field. Um, but uh, but then what does it send to 0? And it's also obviously on to, because by definition, this guy uh, is all the polynomial expressions in u. This takes all the polynomials and plugs in u and gives polynomial expressions in u. So it's obviously on to. Um, but it's not one to one and because it takes uh, p of x and sends it to p of u, which we've said is zero, where p of x is the minimal polynomial of u. So it kills the minimal polynomial and therefore is defined on the quotient once you have a map that kills all these things, it's defined on the quotient vector space. Um, a linear map that kills, uh, sends a, a linear subspace to zero is defined in the quotient vector space. Again, I'm hoping that you've encountered a bit of abstract linear, uh, linear algebra at this point. Uh, we only need it so far for this proof, though. We don't really need it very many other times in, in this module. And uh, so I want to assume that you understand every detail of this proof. Um, because we might, you might not have encountered that necessary abstract linear algebra at this point. But this means it's defined the quotient, but the quotient vector space is what? Well, it's it's when we quotient that by the p of x's and all their multiples. And so it's actually uh, just the, the remainders. The quotient vector space, um, where we quotient at the p of x and all of its multiples, is of course the space of remainders. And in fact, this guy goes to zero exactly when it's a multiple of, 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 the, of the minimal polynomial. Um, that's why it's the remainders, because um, the things that go to zero aren't just the p of x. They're all the multiples of p of x, and they're exactly the multiples of p of x. After all, the minimal polynomial is the greatest common divisor of all the things that get sent to zero. And so it's actually going to um, be the multiples of that that go to zero. 
And so the multiples of that going to zero means that uh, the quotient space is uh, quotienting out all the multiples of p of x, in other words, uh, being left by with the remainders mod modulo p of x. So that gives us remainders, and so we get a map which takes alpha to u and takes any polynomial in alpha to the corresponding polynomial in u as well defined. Um, but we also know that it's got to be one to one because we quotiented out by the by, by the kernel. We took all the things that went to zero. They were just the multiples of p of x, and then quotiented them all out. And so this guy's now one to one and on to. And also it preserves addition, multiplication, and subtraction. And so it's exactly identifying all of the all the algebra of the um, polynomials in alpha with the polynomials in u. They're identified as rings, and therefore they're identified as fields. So a trivial corollary of this is that um, is that every uh, finite degree field extension is algebraic. In other words, well, consists entirely of algebraic elements. Consists entirely of algebraic elements. Um, and, and also that um, uh, maybe less obvious result that um, every field extension by finitely many algebraic uh, elements is an algebraic extension. And the proof is just you extend by putting one in at a time. Each time you do it, you've got an algebraic extension. And so you go up, up, up one at a time. So um, what we want to do is to is to not just um, find a, an extension that gives us one root, but it gives us all the roots, uh, splitting uh, splitting field. So um, a polynomial splits uh, if it uh, if it is a product of linear factors. So as an example, x squared plus 1 is x minus i x plus i over the complex number, so it splits. An extension, capital K of some field, little k, is a splitting field of some polynomial p of x over little k, a polynomial over little k, if it has two properties, one is that p of x splits over big K. And the second property has to have, so that makes it, this this in some sense makes capital K very big. Um, makes it a big field, big enough in which this guy splits. But we also want it to be small in some sense, with some tension between the big and the small. And the smallness is that every element of capital K is a rational function. Uh, with coefficients in little k, a rational function with coefficients in little k of the roots of that p of x. So you can split it and, oh, um, so, sorry, um, uh, so, uh, so we want to say that it's a, it's a splitting field if the polynomial splits, so that makes it a big one, a uh, big field, a big k, but it's actually not that big. Um, we somehow make this big k not so big because every element of it is just a rational function with coefficients and little k of the roots. So you can write it in terms of the roots. So a simple example of that happening is that, of course, um, c as an extension of over r um, uh, is, is simply um, given by um, splitting x squared plus 1 which over r doesn't split, but now it splits over c, and every elm of c can be written in terms of the roots as a, as a rational function of the roots. In fact, it can just be written as some a plus b i, not just, uh, not just a rational function, but even it's good enough to just use the linear functions with a and b uh, real. 
So we want to uh, prove that these things exist, that these splitting fields exist. We won't worry for the moment about whether or not they're unique. Um, so every polynomial in gaining one variable over a field has a splitting field. And in fact, we can, uh, we can um, do better than that uh, if the polynomial has a degree equal to n, then the splitting field has a degree less than or equal to n factorial. The proof is, is essentially uh, quite elementary. Um, what we do is we just split um, p of x first into irreducibles. And all we have to do is add a root to each one. Um, but uh, so, so we really so it's good enough to um, to assume assume p of x is irreducible. So we get a, a product of degrees for at least, at least for, at worst for each one. So when we uh, when we actually add a root to one of them, um, the elements uh, are polynomials. Um, the elements of the extension, when we add the root, look like, as we've seen, they look like adding just just putting in coefficients, alpha to the n. We put in some alpha, some root, and we get these kind of objects. And so, um, but I'm oh, sorry, n, n minus one, minus one, because um, because we can write alpha to the n by using p of x uh, to solve for the alpha to the n equals something lower. We find that everybody can be expressed as something lower than alpha to the n. And that means it has exactly n coefficients, starting at a0, a1, and so on, up to a n minus 1. That's n coefficients. And so that's an n degree, a dimensional extension, at worst. And then um, by induction, we've now split off one root. Um, so p is now reduced uh, down to a product of a linear times, at worst it's a linear times something of lower, um, lower degree, n minus 1. And so you do induction on the degree. We'd sort of like to imagine that we could split all the polynomials at once, and that's the uh, concept that we won't pursue very um, in much depth, but it's nice to know that it exists, the notion of algebraic closure. Um, we could say that a field um, is said to be algebraically closed if um, every uh, polynomial over the, let's say, field k over k splits already over k. We don't have to get into any larger field. So everybody splits. And um, uh, an extension, we have a slightly different notion, an extension, uh, capital K of little k, um, is an algebraic closure of little k if um, it is a splitting field of a collection of, um, sorry, I don't want to say algebraic, is it, sorry, is a splitting field, um, is a splitting field uh, of a collection, uh, of a collection. Um, so let's write it again. So an extension, capital K of little k, is a splitting field of a collection of polynomials over little k. If um, uh, they, well, if they all split and uh, over uh, capital K and um, capital K is generated by their roots. So you have to add, just add those roots in and you get everything. Um, so uh, so that's a splitting field. Um, and then I want to define, sorry, I was messed up here. I want to define an algebraic closure um, if that collection of polynomials is all is just all polynomials. Um, capital K is an algebraic closure of 
of little k. So we have algebraically closed means the, the everybody splits, but an algebraic closure means you've somehow managed to split everybody that didn't split. You've made some bigger field in which everybody now splits, um, and you're gen generated by those guys. So they're two very slightly different notions. Um, and what we want to uh, talk about is, is being able to do both at the same time in some sense. So we want to prove that um, uh, that we can somehow do uh, algebraic uh, algebraic closure and uh, and make it uh, simultaneously algebraically closed, which are slightly different notions. So every field um, little k has an algebraic closure little k bar. It's always a little k bar, and it's re really unique, unique up to an isomorphism. That is to say. An up into a perfect identification of the fields, um, which is the identity on little k. Um, so there's only one, and if you have any, another, if you have one and I have one, they're exactly the same isomorphic. Means they're they're identified perfectly as rings with all their operations and everything, and in such a way that they identify the same the elements of of k with themselves. Um, so um, and um, moreover. Um, this capital K is itself algebraically closed. So that's that's not obviously a different thing, but it is a different thing because we could say, well, maybe maybe you try and solve all the equations in, in K uh, by making some larger field K bar where all of them all of them have now have some so some some roots, some solutions, everybody splits. Now so now we split everybody over K, but what about everybody over K bar? Maybe we need to split them and maybe we need to split them and so on. If maybe you have to keep going and going to keep splitting everybody over here, you have to go to there and if split everybody over here, you go to there and so on and so forth. But it turns out not to happen that in fact already this guy is is algebraically closed. So you could say K bar bar is just K bar. Um, we won't give a proof um, the proof of this is too hard um, for us, so we'll skip that and uh, think instead about uh, just to give a few, couple of examples. Um, so the simplest example is, of course, the real numbers, which is really really where all this somehow comes from. Um, the real numbers, uh, the closure is is the complex numbers, the algebraic closure of the complex numbers. We've already seen that the complex numbers are algebraically closed. Um, that was exactly the fundamental theorem of algebra, that all the complex polynomials have complex solutions. And uh, so in particular, all the real polynomials have, have such solutions. But we also know that C uh, is the splitting field of one particular polynomial of uh, x squared plus 1 over the reals. And so uh, so you have to pass to C to, to solve the polynomial equation. So R can't be its own bar. It has to, its bar has to be at least as big as C, but then once you hit C, you're done. You've got all the, well, you've got an algebraically closed field. Okay, so that's a, that's an example. Um, there's a somewhat uh, dangerous uh, story here though. What about the rationals? Um, and we might wonder what are the, what is the closure of the algebraic closure of the rationals? It turns out it's not all of the complex numbers. It's some collection of complex numbers, which are fairly difficult to, to describe. Um, they don't have a simple, a simple description. So for example, pi is a complex number, but I want to claim it's not in, in Q bar. What would it mean to be in Q bar? What would it mean uh, to be in Q bar is that it would satisfy a polynomial equation. I'm saying, in other words, that P of pi is not zero if P of x is a is, is a, a, a polynomial with rational uh, coefficients and not uh, constant, well, not the zero polynomial. Um, and that's not obvious. So this is this is there. This is quite difficult um, to prove. And obviously we won't prove it, um, but it is true that pi is, is an example of, of 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 a number that's that's not uh, in Q bar um, because it does not satisfy a polynomial over over Q. 
Um, and being in Q bar means exactly that that's where, where the polynomials in Q split. That's the numbers you have to throw in, the complex numbers you have to throw in to get Q to split. But because C is uh, algebraically closed um, by fundamental theorem of algebra, we know C is algebraically closed. And we know that Q sits inside um, inside C. So if we just add in all of the roots we need that come from C, uh, that the roots to, 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 to polynomials in Q, we add them in, then we already get Q bar. Um, but what we don't know is how to describe it more explicitly. An another uh, interesting observation about algebraic closure is that uh, we often had fields that were finite. For example, we know that Z mod PZ had only the remainder 0 to P minus 1 in it. So it was finite, had finitely many elements. Um, and so um, so what we could wonder is, uh, as an example, if we had K a finite field, that is to say with finitely many elements, um, could it be algebraically closed? Um, and it turns out it can't be, and here's why. Suppose we write it, it's finite, so there's finitely many elements, and we'll just give them all names, alpha 1 to alpha n. And then suppose we take the polynomial uh, that's given by 1 plus x minus alpha 1, dot, 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 x minus alpha n. Note that this part, without the 1, this vanishes no matter what you plug in. But then when you add 1, then it doesn't vanish no matter what you plug in. It has no roots in k. So if you want to try and split it, you have to make something bigger. If you want to make any root at all, you have to make something bigger. And so therefore, k is not algebraically closed. And that's true for any finite field, in particular for this one. So you can't make a finite field be algebraically closed. Algebraically closed uh, fields are infinite, they have infinitely many elements. And that means, in particular, if we just take this simple thing like, for example, z mod 2z only has just 0 and 1 in it, it's not algebraically closed. We actually saw an example. We could do x squared plus x plus 1 is not doesn't have a root in it. You had to make a bigger uh, field to get a root. And if you keep going, you get bigger and bigger and bigger fields, uh, but you you never stop. You never run into, after no, no, all, any finite number of steps, you still haven't reached the algebraic closure. So far we've talked a lot about polynomials, which have only finitely many terms. In our next, next lecture, we'll think about infinite series expansions and their algebraic structure.